The most important thing in the world is health, because you have nothing if you're dying. Second thing is, is family and friends who you love. And the third is money, because it's everything else. The smartest thing the rich people ever did was convince the broke people that money doesn't make you happy. <laughs> Biggest scam alive, because money is freedom. It's freedom to drive what you want, eat where you want, go where you want. Money is freedom. So you want to say money doesn't buy happiness, well then you're saying you're happy to be a slave, because only money is going to give you freedom. So money absolutely <laughs> is happiness, because freedom is a bare minimum requisite to happiness. I can't think of many scenarios where being rich was a detriment over being poor. There's not many. I think money is a bare minimum requirement for happiness, especially if you're a masculine man who wants to outcompete. Then you need money, because money is basically everything. And they've convinced people, the poor people, oh yeah, he has money, but you know, I have friends and family who love me. So do I. People are psyoped into thinking that rich people are somehow lacking somewhere else. And I'm sure some of them are, but not all of them. There are some people that have everything, just have to accept it. Some people just have it all. They have friends and family and good relationships and love their kids and a bunch of money. And if that doesn't anger you to get up and make a bunch of money, well, I don't know what will. The solutions I've, I've come up with in my mind, of course, are money because money is power. Mm. I want people to understand that when I talk about, we talk about how money is the root of all evil. Money is also the root of all good. Money is, money is the vested time and interest of other humans. Mm. If you have a bunch of money, you have the stored energy of other people. I'll give you a very simple example. I have money, so I can get somebody to sweep my floor. I have their stored time and energy in a note or, or on a bank balance where I can make them sweep a floor for as many hours as I so choose because I can afford to pay them. It's the stored time and energy of other people. So for evil to be done, it requires the time and energy of humans. And for good to be done, it requires the time and energy of humans. So money is like gunpowder. It can be used for good. It can be used for bad. It's like germ theory. You can save people's lives or you can create a pathogen that decimates a populace. So it, it can go both ways. Money is certainly an answer because if you're completely broke, it's hard for you to influence other people and influence the world by extension. So money is super important. And the other thing I think is important is fraternity and brotherhood and living for something larger than just money itself. Mm. I've never in my life seen anyone who's determined to get something, not get it. I've never seen somebody who is determined in their heart to get something, not get it. The universe and God is so giving and providing. People think it's difficult out here. I disagree. I've never seen someone wake up and say, nah, this is all I care about. This is all I want. Not get it. Everyone who thought that way in fighting was a world champion. Everyone who thought that way about money was rich. I've never seen anyone fail. Bro, I've seen people with no credit score and no job determined to get an R8, manage to get one on finance somehow. I've seen it. If it's all you want, you're gonna get it. You're gonna find a way to you're get it. You're gonna find a way. Yeah, yeah. People go, oh, I want this. If you want it, you have it. People often say, if you try your best, it's okay to fail. Mm. But what they don't understand, the true secret to the universe is that if you try your best, you never fail. Yeah, That's what people don't understand. And, and most people aren't trying. They aren't trying. They don't know what trying is. People are genuinely not out here giving their absolute best because if you were, you'd have everything you've ever desired. You'd have anything you've ever wanted and asked for. Instead, what people do is they cope and convince themselves they're trying. Oh, I tried, but I need a work-life balance, and it's hard, and I was trying. All garbage, all code. I can't stop myself working as a person who doesn't need money. And then there's people with no money who don't work. Honest, yeah. It blows my mind, which is why the winners are winners and the losers are losers. Losers do a little bit of work and rest. Winners work as hard as possible and worry they're not working hard enough. It's just a separation of, of personality types. I have something I, I sent in my email recently. I said, you could give the average man a brand new Ferrari and a road map and a coffee and a full tank of gas and tell him the destination, success. And halfway along the drive, he'll quit because it's too far. No matter how well you set it up for people, they'll quit. It's over 10% into the year now. I wonder if anyone who made a New Year's resolution sits and says, it's over 10% into the year. Am I at 10% of my goal? Mm. Because your ass said you were gonna be a millionaire when you were drunk on New Year's Eve. Well, you need to have 100 grand saved. Do you have 100,000? Have you even done the feedback on your own goal you made 30 short days ago to realize that you're nowhere near it and you're not gonna make it? No. Oh, I got the rest of the year. Um, and then wonder why they fail. You should have a daily target. Not enough people look back on what they did and identify where they made a mistake. And some people will do it when they lose. 
but the true professionals do it when they win. Mm. When my dad was playing a chess game, if he won the game, he would still analyze the game and see if he could have lost, where it could have gone wrong, how he could have won faster, what mistakes he did make, what he did well, what he did wrong, win or lose. So many people will sit in a scenario where everything went wrong and go, in fact, correction, not so many people. I would say 75% of people will not ever self-analyze the situation or in the blame of everyone else. If they went to jail like I did, they'd say, they put me in jail because they're liars and the matrix did it. Did it. Fine, true. But when I was in jail, I was like, how did I get here? What did I do? What did I say? Who did I piss off? What institutions want me in jail? What did I do that angered them? Me, me, me. I'm taking absolute self-accountability for everything. I'm not blaming anyone thing else because if I blame everything else, I have no control. Mm. If I blame myself that I can influence it, I have control over it. So 75% of people blame other people or they blame other things. I lost my business because of COVID. No, you lost your business because of you. I lost my girl because her friends were No, you lost your girl because of you. You lost your car because of you. And it's all your fault because that's the only thing that gives you control and power. The other 10%, we said 75, that's 85, now it has to be much higher. Let's say the other 20%, which brings up to 95% of total of the populace, will look at a situation in which they lose and they might self-analyze and they might try and learn from the loss and they'll try and find the feedback involved in the loss to make sure they don't lose again, which is obviously better than not, not analyzing at all. At all, yeah. And the top 5%, the absolute highest echelon, are people who are going to analyze every decision they've ever made, win or lose. I analyze my wins as well. See where you went right. See, see where, where I went right, see where I went wrong, see where it worked. You need to analyze your whole life. Your life needs to be feedback. You know, I always found the one thing that was always amazing to me, and this happened to me even just the other day. I'll be driving one of my 59 Supergirls, and it's raining, and it's dark, and it's cold. And I see people at a bus stop, and I'm at the traffic light. Like, it's freezing, and it's raining, and it's nighttime, and you can't afford an Uber. If that won't motivate you, I don't know what will. Because the worst thing about the bus isn't the bus, it's the time you wait for the bus time is money. You're gonna sit down there for 45 minutes in the freezing cold and waste your time to save a couple dollars on an Uber and you don't feel panic to get rich. This is what's another thing that's amazing to me about motivation. I don't feel motivated. Neither do I sometimes. You're not gonna always feel like doing it. You have to do it anyway, because it's your duty to do it because you don't want to be a fucking loser. That's the whole point. If you felt like doing it all the time, then there would be no magic to it. The magic is that you do it regardless of how you feel. What do you mean you need motivation? You don't, you don't need motivation. You have a duty to not be a loser anymore because the hole in the sky is closing. I think most normal people understand if you were to ask them how is the economy, they'd say, well, it's impossible. I can't pay for my bills. I can't pay to eat. I can't afford a house. I can barely afford my mortgage. I'm never gonna get rich this way. They understand all of this, but they're not panicking. Mm. And people are sitting here now going, oh yeah, the economy's bad, but you know, maybe if we vote for this person, who are you gonna vote for that's gonna put money in your pocket actually? Actually come along and say, here's money. Nobody. Still got to pay your council tax. Still a brokey. Nobody cares. No one you vote for is going to change it. It's going to get worse. It's going to continue. And you know the boat is going to sink and you're not panicking. That's why I kind of catch myself. And one of the things I try very hard not to do is become elitist. Because when you've come from the absolute bottom to the absolute top and you've done it all off of your own back, and hard work and dedication and never missing a day. The only shortcut to life is to never miss a day. One, because of comp compounding interest. And two, because sometimes you get lucky. And you'll never miss a lucky day if you try every day. If you don't try every day, you might miss your lucky day. And that's what people don't understand. If you never miss a day and you never don't try and you're always on time, was I late today? No, on time. And you try and improve every aspect of your life and you're a professional and you try and make sure that you analyze your decisions, you give yourself feedback, you don't make mistakes, you're not lazy. If you try and you make it to the top, you end up elitist because you look at the people down below and you're like, well, why didn't you try? I did. I think men are happy when they feel better. I think we're naturally competitive. That's why we've always done what we've done. Why did Genghis Khan need Vienna? Bro, that's Austria. Look at that map. 
Why did he need Vienna? It took him probably three months to even hear they were at Vienna. By the time he got the message, they probably already conquered it. Why did he need it? Because he won. Why do I need the stuff I have? Because other people can't have it as much. And I think that that's where masculine happiness comes from. Because I think men are happy when they feel respected. And you're going to respect yourself if you look around and you have things other people don't have. Why do I walk into the showroom and buy the two available cars that I don't want? Because it's one man's dream and now another man can't buy it. Why do you play sports? To win. To win. Why do you want to put a ball in a net more times than the other people? To show that you're better than them at putting a ball in a net. How insignificant an action. A ball in a net. Who cares? A much more significant action would be making a bunch of money. Or being physically stronger or a better fighter. Or being smarter, a quicker talker. Or being more well known, more respected, more influential. That's far more important than putting a ball in a net. And you'll spend your time putting a ball in a net to prove you're better than other people. So don't sit and say that I'm a bad person for proving I'm better than everyone else by all the things I'm doing. That's masculine competition. If there's a game being played and some men realize it's a battle and some men don't realize there's a battle going on, how can they possibly win? So some of you men are waking up every day not realizing you're in a forever permanent competition with every single man around you for everything all of the time. And that doesn't ever cross your mind and you wonder why you permanently lose. Well, it crosses my mind and that's why I'm beating you. Women want the men who think this way. Women want the men who understand this, who win. That's who women want. So you can call it arrogant. You can call it egotistical. I call it winning. I call it realism, I call it realistic. And the best things about having most of the things I have is that other people can't have them. That's the bottom line of it. It's the reason why billionaires buy a bigger yacht than the billionaire next to them. They do not need an extra 20 foot feet of deck space. <laughs> they want the biggest yacht in the harbor. It's the reason why they buy one of one Picassos. It's the reason why when Bugatti launch a new car with 80 units, they're all sold same day. That's why. Because winners all think the same way. And anyone who sits and goes, well, you should be more humble. I hear that sometimes. And then I look at who said it to me. And whenever someone tells me their opinion, this is a habit I give everyone at home. Whenever somebody gives you their opinion on anything, listen to the opinion and then stop and look at who told it to you. Because you never want to adopt the thinking of somebody who you don't want to be. Because their thinking made them. So whatever they believe in their mind is why they are the person they are. So if somebody sits and says to you, you should be more humble. I sit and think, okay, it's my logical, this is how my brain works. He believes I should be more humble. That's how his mind operates. The closer my mind operates to his mind, the more likely I am to be like him. Who is he? And I'll look at the person who said that to me and say, no way. Because most people who talk about humble, all they really want is to not be reminded of how they have failed. They don't want me to make it clear to them that they have failed. They have failed. I feel like normalcy has been changed from being a winner to being a loser. In the 60s, you could be a normal man who worked in a factory, an unskilled labor job, and with one wage, you could afford a house, you could afford a car, you could afford to raise a family, your children would not be taught garbage in school, yep. your wife would respect you, you'd have a home-cooked meal. Times were good. Like, times were good. All the things I said about playing Uno earlier in Hyper Bowl are true. What matters most? Your wife loves you, you're respected as the breadwinner, your kids respect you, they listen to you, mm -hmm. your house is clean, your house is safe, your car works, your life is good. So now being normal is just losing in a way which is so familiar to the people around you are losing that you don't realize you've lost at all. Because everyone's losing. So you're like, oh, I'm just normal. No, no, you've all lost. You've all lost. None of you are free. You've all lost. And that's even more scary. You can't even be normal anymore. To be a winner, you have to be exceptional. You could be a winner as a normal person only 50, 60 years ago. Now the normal people can't even win. So you need to be able to do amazing things and then be proud of yourself. Don't sit and think you're great for no reason. That is arrogance. I'd argue that the normal person who thinks they're so unique and great for no reason is more arrogant than me. The problem with most people in the world today is not that they do a normal thing, it's that they do a normal thing and they don't try to be the best at it. So you can be a barista and you can just make coffees or you can be a barista that makes the fancy coffees and can turn over all the cups and do like the, the tricks and yeah. all the garbage. <laughs> we have a man who became a billionaire from salt. Yes from salt. <laughs> you can all put salt on, he did it the best. Bam. 
So the first thing you need to do is get very good at making coffees. That's the first thing you need to do. Be able to do it in a fancy way. Then you need to solicit attention. Well, you can make coffees in a fancy way, you can hire a videographer, you can then begin to make fancy coffees in a fancy way, and you can make it look good with a finalized product, and you can get a nice video made that's well cut with some fancy music, you begin to put them on Instagram and solicit people to watch your Instagram page. Now you have attention. How do you then turn that attention into money after you began to show your fancy coffees? Well, you could, let's say, put together a course or an academy or write a book on the magic of coffee or the secrets of coffee. And you would put a mystery on it. Don't say, I'll teach you how to make coffee. No, say the secrets of coffee. You'd have a link in your Instagram page and it would be $9 and it would tell people the secrets how to make coffee. You'd start to sell that for $9. You'd make a couple hundred or a couple thousand, not too much, but you continue to make fancy coffees. People continue to go to your Instagram page. You're now selling the secrets of how to make coffee. Then after people start knowing you as being a barista, you start to make these $9. You have $20,000, $30,000 in the bank. What you can do is launch your own coffee brand. You can go to Alibaba.com. You can find some coffee beans. You can put your face on it because your face is now a recognized brand. You can get your own coffee beans. You can just begin to sell them on Instagram. Before you know it, you're making $10,000 or $15,000 a month. You can start to do tours. You can start to put posters on your Instagram or in your Instagram stories saying, I'm going to do master classes on how to make coffee, 20 people only, $1,000 each at this premium barista speciality coffee shop in London. The coffee shop will allow you to do it for free because they want people to know, get the advertising from you and your brand. You'll charge $1,000 each. That's 20 grand for a day to teach people how to pour milk in a cup. Boom. You've got a coffee brand, you've got an online school, you're doing seminars, you put in a little bit of effort, now you drive a Ferrari. Done. It is that easy to get rich in the world today if you actually try. You try. Instead, you'll go to work every day, make the coffees, go home, off. Some people are so lazy that they will work every day instead of get rich. And they think because they're working every day that they're not lazy. Everything I just told you about that could work for an electrician. Teach people how to wire a blow. Who gives it? You'll make some money if you try. So I think the best mental model as a man is to understand that you cannot be normal. You need to be exceptional. You need to do exceptional things. That ties into the exceptionally good and the exceptionally bad, like we talked earlier, which means you need to be hard on yourself so you can deal with the exceptionally bad. And if you start to do all these things, they all compound. Everything I've said across all these hours all tie into each other, and you end up in one result. You end up in one place, which is brutal competence, brutal masculine competence. There's nowhere else to be. Nothing will save you besides your own brutal competence. Or I believe that getting rich is one of the best things you can possibly do to help save the world.